Coming Back is a listener-supported podcast. If you like the show and want to see it reach more grieving ears and hearts, support Coming Back on Patreon at patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. My Patreon supporters get exclusive access to weekly grief journaling prompts and live grief hangouts with me. Pledge for as little as $1 per month and change or cancel your support at any time. Join this growing behind-the-scenes community now at patreon.com slash Shelby for Scythia. Thank you so much for listening to Coming Back. Just one more thing, grief growers. Do you ever feel trapped, stuck, or silenced in the aftermath of loss? Are you struggling to figure out who you are now or what your life is made of now that death, divorce, or diagnosis has steamrolled through? Whether you're trying to cultivate deeper self-compassion, figure out where grief belongs in your life now, or simply feel like you have more room to breathe, the three words that your heart needs to hear are permission to grieve. Permission to grieve is the title of my latest book, a tribute to the three little words that changed how I saw myself and my grief after the death of my mom. I know it has the power to change how you see yourself and your grief in whatever loss you're facing. You can find Permission to Grieve now on Amazon. Give yourself more grace, space, and room to breathe in the aftermath of loss, because we could all use a little more Permission to Grieve. Hi there, and welcome to Coming Back, a podcast about coming back to life after death, divorce, diagnosis, and more. On today's show, I'm talking to Rachel Whalen, the author behind An Unexpected Family Outing, and a grieving mother who has experienced both miscarriage and stillbirth. Also this week, I'm talking about the societal teaching of life rejection and sharing a passage from my new book, Permission to Grieve. I'm Shelby Forsythia, an intuitive grief guide and author who speaks, writes, and teaches powerful truths on grief and loss. My mom's death in 2013 set me on the path to becoming a lifelong student of grief, and I use what I learn to help others find direction, get support, and cultivate radical self-compassion in the aftermath of loss. Because even through grief, we are growing. Let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Coming Back. Thank you so much for tuning in today. It has been exactly one week since the launch of my new book, Permission to Grieve, and already, grief growers, you have given yourselves so much permission to grieve. You have ordered the book, you've left reviews on Amazon and Goodreads, and you've shared permission to grieve with friends and family. Those of you receiving my emails know that Permission to Grieve was listed in the top five new releases in loss and grief on Amazon over the weekend, and I just can't tell you how incredible that is for a brand new first-time self-published author. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I am so grateful for you, grief growers. Many of you have been sending me photos and videos as well, so if you'd like to be featured on my Instagram or Facebook page, send a picture of you or a friend or a family member or a pet with your copy of Permission to Grieve. I'd love to know what you think of the book, what sections you're highlighting, and what illustrations have stuck out to you. Also, in the very near future, I am starting to reach out to other podcasts and outlets to tell the story of Permission to Grieve. So if there's a podcast you'd love to see me interview on as a guest, email me at shelby at shelbyforsythia.com. I am a very smart lady, but I cannot possibly think of every place there is to be featured. And I trust your recommendations as very valuable places to show up with my grief story in tow. And I know if you've been listening to this show long enough that you know the value of getting permission to grieve to more ears and more hearts that are grieving. Just a quick reminder too, that in a little less than two weeks, I'm going live over on YouTube for an hour's worth of grief guidance and support. So if you're looking for support beyond this podcast and want to chat with other grieving listeners of coming back, I would love to see you there on Monday, September 23rd at 8 p.m. Central Time. You can find all of the links and more information over on my Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash Shelby for And of course, there's a link to my Patreon page in the show notes as well. 
Just $1 per month gets you access to the link to join us live for grief support on Patreon and unlocks so much more too, including Monday morning grief journaling prompts and all of my private behind the scenes posts on grief and loss. So I definitely hope to see you there on September 23rd at 8 p.m. Central. All right, so for this week's top of the show, I want to talk about a societal phenomenon known as life rejection. There are two big things that stop us from giving ourselves permission to grieve, and life rejection is one of the two. The other one I'll actually talk about next week, so you have to tune into that episode of Coming Back to Hear It. Life rejection isn't something that's our fault. It's learned. It's a tool that's passed around, passed down from society and family and friends. Despite the fact that it's something that's learned, it's not something that we can easily break free from. It's like ingrained. It's so learned. And it doesn't really stop us from using it as a go-to tool when our lives are falling apart. So check out this excerpt from Permission to Grieve about life rejection and how it shows up in the aftermath of loss. And also, if you're listening with small children, just a heads up that there is a teeny bit of profanity in this excerpt from the book. Enter life rejection. Life rejection is a severe, forceful pushing away of life, with life being defined as everything outside of yourself that composes the building blocks of your world. Some people would call this your circumstances, story, or life narrative. However you choose to phrase it, when you reject life, it looks like this. The effects of your loss are so severe, so wild, so unknown, so crazy, that it's as if your life no longer belongs to you. Life rejection is a snarling, bitter, righteous, aggressive, all-consuming, overwhelming energy that is more than happy to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You wind up thinking, this loss is now part of my story? Fuck that. If that's the case, nothing about this life is good, real, or true. If you've ever seen a child spit out their first taste of yucky pureed vegetables, you know this energy because you know the child is thinking, that's what you're feeding me? No, I don't want any part of that. If that's what you're going to feed me, I'm not going to eat at all. Dial that energy up to 11,000 times, and you've got a pretty good idea of what life rejection looks like. In the midst of my loss, my life said to me, your mom is dead. To which I replied, nope, that's not mine. That doesn't belong to me. If that's what my story looks like, I don't want any part of it. Count me out. I disconnected myself from my entire past, present, and future. If my mom was going to die, was already dead, and was going to remain dead for the rest of my life, then I didn't want to belong to that story. I would rather be lifeless than participate in a narrative where my mom was dead. Life rejection is a total dissociation and detachment from life as you know it. If you've ever caught yourself thinking, this is not my life, then life rejection is probably present in your world. Pause button. What life story are you currently rejecting? Is it the death of a loved one, a relationship that's falling or has fallen apart, a catastrophic diagnosis, or something else? What about your life feels like it doesn't belong to you? What have you disconnected from, work, school, relationships, because of your loss? Now let me be very clear here. Life rejection is not denial. It is not a naive looking away from your loss as if it wasn't there. You've seen those silly YouTube videos, right? The ones where a dog looks away from their owner's shredded couch as if they hadn't just spent the last hour ripping it to pieces. Life rejection is not about ignoring loss. Life rejection is a full-on, open-eyed, total body encounter with the loss that just steamrolled your life and the subsequent decision to not engage with it. It's as if life slid a 40-page legal contract across the table to you, and you read it in its entirety, and then slid it back without signing. That's what you're asking me to sign up for? No, life. I do not agree to those terms and conditions. Whether someone you love has died, and you can't imagine yourself surviving in a world without them, or you've just been served divorce papers wrecking your dream of a long and happy future, 
or you've just received a life-changing diagnosis that takes away your balance, health, and control, the outcome is the same. This is not my life. This doesn't belong to me. This is not happening. On the outside, life rejection looks like going through the motions, but not connecting with them. It looks like smiling and nodding, but not really feeling happy or in agreement with what's happening. It looks like showing up, doing the work, and making an appearance, but not consciously engaging with anyone or anything. Life rejection feels like being a life-sized puppet, where the eyes and mouth and limbs are moving, but the soul and spirit, the sense of belonging to your life, are nowhere to be found. You're alive, but you aren't truly living. You exist, but you're not really there. You are participating, but you're not really present. Not in the slightest. I was in college when my mom died. For me, life rejection felt like I was living my life behind a thick pane of glass. I was disengaged at all times, one step removed from everything happening around me. I returned to campus, participated in classes, and even graduated with honors, but especially in those first months following my mom's death, it was like I was living someone else's life, or like I was living in a movie directed by the world's cruelest movie director. I was an actress showing up to play a part, not the person who wrote the play. Where I had once identified so much with a world of learning all I could learn, diligently working towards dreams and goals and actively showing up for club meetings, parties, and social events, I now felt distant from all of it. The suffocating wool blanket of my mom is dead covered everything I used to call my life. So I disconnected from it. I didn't belong to it anymore. I kept showing up, robotically moving through the motions. On the outside, I looked like I was doing okay. But on the inside, nothing I was surrounded by felt like mine. I was checking tasks off the list, but I wasn't the person who made the list. I didn't even care whether or not the list got completed anymore. I had switched from manual to automatic. Life continued, but I was no longer driving. I was just along for the ride. If you're nodding your head up and down right now or shouting, holy crap, there's a name for life rejection, I hope you'll pick up a copy of Permission to Grieve on Amazon. I go so much deeper in the book about how life rejection is taught to us by the world that we live in and how we can untangle ourselves from it in order to give ourselves more permission to grieve. You can find a link to Permission to Grieve in the show notes. Up next, my conversation with bereaved mom, Rachel Whalen, the writer behind An Unexpected Family Outing. Grief is setting sail, twice, on the 2020 bereavement cruises. To join a boatload of grieving hearts for interactive grief workshops, heart healing craft projects, Circles of Hope, and a beautiful candlelit night of remembrance at sea. Request more information at comingbackcruise.com. You'll be contacted by the cruise's organizer and previous Coming Back podcast guest, Linda Finley, to hear more about your choice of two tropical cruises setting sail in 2020. And when you're ready, she'll help you reserve your spot on board. Bereavement cruise cabins do go quickly, so request more information now at comingbackcruise.com where grief finds support and community on the open sea. Rachel Whalen is a mother, kindergarten teacher, and writer who lives in Vermont. She has two daughters, Frances, age two, and Dorothy, who would be three. She is the creator of An Unexpected Family Outing, a blog where she shares her experiences and thoughts on grief, stillbirth, miscarriage, and parenting after loss. Her writing has been widely featured and can be found on websites like Her View From Home, The Today Show, Love What Matters, and Cafe Mom. Her latest venture finds her teaming up with fellow writer and loss mom, Emily Long, as they open their nonprofit pregnancy, infant, and child loss resource center called Lumos House. Rachel, I am honored to have you here on Coming Back today because I follow a couple of different hashtags on Instagram. Uh, including bereavement and grief quotes and bereaved mothers. And I came across your 
page by accident, and you wrote a scathing retort to a Dear Abby <laughs> column for bereaved mothers, a, a woman who was missing her child after 20 years, and Dear Abby just totally got the whole thing wrong. And I was so floored by the way that you wrote, and it was just so unapologetic. I had to ask you on the show. So welcome to coming back, and I would absolutely love if we could jump in with your lost story. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is just such an honor. Um, so I guess I'll just, I mean, it's its a long story, so I'll truncate it as best I can. Um, I was pregnant with my daughter, Dorothy. She was my third pregnancy. Um, my previous two pregnancies had been first her uh, miscarriages. And so when we got pregnant with her, uh, the, my whole mindset the whole time was, even though I was terrified, was third time's a charm. This is going to work. I will bring home a living baby, um, all kinds of mantras. Uh, at about 28 weeks, I went in for a routine appointment and my blood pressure was elevated. About three days later, I found myself in the hospital with severe preeclampsia. And um, basically the plan was admit me on bed rest, monitor baby, make sure I was okay. And the goal was to make it uh, another like five to six weeks to make it to 34 weeks. Uh, about a week after they brought, uh, they admitted me to the hospital. Uh, they came in for a routine vitals check and all week long, everything had been great. Uh, but about one thirty in the morning, they came in for a routine vitals check in. They couldn't find Dorothy's heartbeat and they brought in, you know, machine after machine, ultrasound, NST, doctors, nurses, everybody's looking and trying to find it. And I just, I knew before they said the words that she was gone. And that kind of set into motion a really chaotic 24 to 48 hours for me. I got very sick. Uh, and as I was in labor and delivery and we were getting my, getting me prepped to deliver her, I uh, ended up medically crashing and being rushed down to the ICU. And, and at about 10 o'clock in the morning is when I delivered her in the ICU while my kidneys were shutting down and my lungs were not taking in oxygen and my, you know, liver was starting to fail and, and it just chaos was just going inside my body, inside my world. And, and I, uh, I was able to spend about 30 minutes with Dorothy. Uh, my doctors were able to grant me about that much time before they had to come in and kind of keep doing their work of keeping me alive. And after she died, I spent another week in the hospital and we then went home without a baby, which is a feeling I just, to this day, I mean, it's been, th it's been about three and a half years. Um, it still feels surreal to me that we left that hospital without her, um, that I passed her off to a nurse and watched that door close and, and I've never seen her again. About a year after Dorothy was born, we actually were able to welcome her little sister, Frances, uh, who's now two. And so I, you know, I'm now living this life of parenting uh, two daughters, one who's here with me and one who is way beyond my reach, but um, who has taught me so much about how far love can go. And I'm just the proudest mom of two beautiful girls. And I just wish desperately they both were here. And so that's, you know, kind of where I am today. I get chills thinking about your story because the phrase that just flashed in front of my eyes as you were talking was profound emptiness. And man, this is yeah. something that comes up. I mean, we've had many stories of grief here on the show and of miscarriage, stillbirth, delivering babies and not being able to take them home also. And there's something that happens like with people with wombs and ovaries and vaginas in particular, where it's like, <sighs> death can happen inside of our bodies. And it's a totally absolutely yeah. unique process. And the first time I landed on it, we had a guest on the show named Corin Holmes. And she wrote a book called How to Survive a Miscarriage. And she was like, and she phrased it that way. And I was like, that's the first time I've ever heard it phrased that way. Because for the most part, death happens 
outside of us, but it becomes a whole other thing when our bodies are where it takes place. Um, and that's just wild. I want to um, go a little bit farther into your past because you opened up speaking about um, these two previous first term miscarriages. And then kind of when I hear you speak about yourself and your story, you say you're a parent of two. So I wonder, this is, I don't know how this is going to be phrased exactly, but what was your grief for them like? And how do you define who your children are now? Because you're very, very clear that Dorothy and Francis, you're like, these are the two that I'm parenting, one from far away and one very present. And then there were these yeah. other two where grief yeah. happened as well. And it's, this isn't necessarily a question that's looking for like, what qualifies you to call a being inside you, your child, but also yeah. there is some kind of identification, I think that's happening here for you. That's important to, to hallmark and recognize. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I, the, I'm in that situation where there's so many people who are in my situation where they've had miscarriages and experienced a stillbirth. And, and it is, I feel like it's very, it can become very contentious to discuss this kind of in our community of lost families and lost moms about, you know, we, we don't want to compare losses and, and yet they are so very, the experiences are so very different. That being said, the grief for each one of my losses is so very, uh, very valid and very present and, and very profound in its own ways. Um, and I really see myself, you know, I, I was a mother to four babies, but I, I find myself really mothering my two daughters more intentionally. I think that by doing the work that I do and writing and being so open with my grief and talking about my miscarriages, I do feel like that is lending kind of a parenting hand to those those babies that I lost. And I do feel a connection to them. But I, I think there's just something about um, Dorothy that was such just such a, a deeper connection than I had with the other two. Not and not saying one is 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 stronger than the other. That's and, and all I can ever do is speak to my own experience. You know, had had it had just been, you know, my one miscarriage and then I had a living baby, perhaps I would still think of myself as a mother of two. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm I'm not sure. Um, but at this point in my life I, I really when I think about myself as a mother, I recognize and I honor and I, I see all of my pregnancies and, and I hold space for all of them. But Dorothy and Francis are, are who I think of as my, my two daughters. I just want to take a moment to tremendously thank you for answering that question because it was a hard question to ask and phrase because I'm like, I'm not asking you to compare your losses, but how is it true for you? But I imagine it's an even harder question to answer. But as you were answering, I was nodding my head like, that makes so much sense because what happens as we continue to live our life and experience losses, the the new losses or the more recent losses put the former losses or the more past losses into a different kind of perspective. And they don't fade away or get any smaller or become less significant. They just change because we have lived more life and experienced different losses. There's a beautiful cartoon that a company called The Jar of Salt did. And it's a, a book on a bookshelf that says grief on the spine. And it's this big, thick black book. And then over time, yeah. a lot more books get added yeah. to the shelf. Yeah. And grief never yeah. shrinks in size. Yeah. And I was like, that's brilliant. And and that's how I'm yeah. phrasing it here. And I love even too, that you said, this is personal for my own experience. Because you know, if it had happened differently, if you had one miscarriage and then had a, a live living baby that came all the way through and you did get to take her home from the hospital, it would be reflected as a different kind of grief. But because of how this unfolded, how this ironed out in your world, you're like, this is how I define this for me. And it speaks to just this reality that all of our griefs are so entirely different. Um, I want to get to this place of continuing to try for babies, for children, for, um, for hope. I wonder maybe where that comes from for you. You mean trying to have another child after having losses? 
Mm -hmm. Because that's something that I see so often as a thread in infertility communities, in stillbirth and miscarriage communities. It's like, I'm going to go back in. I'm going to do this again. And it, um, it blows my mind every time. And that's like, you know, grievers lose parents or lose spouses or lose children. And we're like, I'm going to love again. But something about this process, again, of it happening inside of your body, I'm like, wow, it's a whole other level of commitment yeah. to being alive for this I, to take place. I, I mean, I have to say with, I, I was surprised myself with how quickly I wanted to try again after Dorothy. It didn't really surprise me how quickly I wanted to try again after my first two losses. And in these three pregnancies happened, um, you know, my first two babies and then Dorothy happened all within about a year and a half. Um, I was, you know, it was February, 2015, July, 2015, and then um, Dorothy passed away in February, 2016. And so in about a year, less than a year and a half time, I was pregnant with three children, lost three children. And, and, I think the first, with my first two losses, I still was so, they were, they were early enough where, and I don't like saying that because, you know, it, it really can't, I have a, there's a wonderful quote by a, a friend of mine who's a writer. Uh, she wrote this beautiful piece about how love can't be measured in weeks, like when it comes to a pregnancy and infant loss. And, and it's so true. But I think with the first two, everything happened so quickly. I was so kind of numb to it that it just was like, I didn't have a living, you know, okay, this pregnancy didn't work. I'm on to the next one. But like you said, as my experiences grew and I, and I walked further into pregnancy and understanding what that was in motherhood and, and, um, it just, I was surprised with Dorothy how quickly I turned around and said, I want to do this again. And I, I sometimes wonder if it was like, I was still in shock, you know, <laughs> like it was just kind of like my default. Like I needed something to do some action to take and having another baby was an action to take. Um, but we, we turned around pretty quickly and, and, you know, we're fortunate to get pregnant again. And, and I often say, you know, and I've been very candid about this in my, my writing and talking with people our issue has is never lied in being pregnant. My issue has is lied in keeping babies. Um, you know, I, I, I've never had to worry about becoming pregnant and that's such a privilege of mine, but my, my kind of curse, so to be it is, um, is keeping them and having them stick around. And, and honestly, all throughout my pregnancy with Francis, I just was in this state of, I think just numbness and shock because it hadn't even been a, I mean, I celebrated my, I celebrated Dorothy's what would be her first birthday, you know, eight months pregnant with her sister, you know, and wondering, I just was so in shock and just so numb to everything. And I, I really, what I found and what I will share with other moms now who are pregnant after loss, they feel such guilt because they feel like they can't tap into all their grief for their, ch their, their children that they lost because they're so focused on the child that's with them, or they want to tap into the grief and they kind of turn off the focus from the child they're pregnant with because it feels really hard to hold space for both. And I just say to them all the time, like that is just, you are just doing what any parent of multiple children does. And sometimes you have to focus and shift your attention attention to one of your children more than the other. And, and that's what you have to do when you're grieving a child and then being pregnant after a loss and parenting after that loss. So, um, and, and I think there was hope in there. I, I don't know that it was coming from me. I was, I was kind of gathering the hope from others around me, specifically my, my, I was very blessed to have such an incredible medical team uh, who carried me through the end of my pregnancy with Dorothy, who were there when she was born and who turned right around and were there to support me when I was ready to try again and, and eventually had Francis. And I feel like I got a lot of hope from them. I got a lot of hope from the people around me. Um, maybe wasn't always the most, wasn't always willing to take the hope because as I was still so raw in my grief, hope stings a lot. I feel like, you know, it's not necessarily easy to sit with. So um, there was hope there, but I think it was just for me, uh, again, always can, can only ever speak to my own experience. For me, it was just kind of like, 
this I, a little bit of this numbness and detachment that I experienced, and and I felt very guilty about that at the time. I now know that I was really just in survival mode, um, and it wasn't really until after Francis was born that I found myself able to lean into the grief in the way that I needed to in order to heal. Um, so I kind of, it is possible to put it on hold, but I think um, it, if you, if you don't return to it, it will find its way to you for sure. So, yeah. I think you've hit the nail on the head in that our brains and our bodies do this protective thing where they numb us out for a little bit because the shock of a grief experience is just so great. And so we can do other things. We can take actions. We can, in my own experience, I like moved to a whole nother mm-hmm. city. I relocated from yeah. North Carolina to Chicago uh, about six yeah. months after my mom died. And then finally I got there and I was like, wow, what the hell did I just do? Um, yeah. Because the numbness wore off. And I was like, that protective fuzzy blanket thing that was yeah. covering my eyes for a while is gone. Um, I want to reiterate this thing that you said, though, because I think it was just so powerful. I got chills when you said it. When you were reassuring other mothers and other parents that it's so hard to hold love for a living child while still grieving a dead one. This normalization of you're doing what any other parent in the world has to do when they have multiple children. And that is sometimes you have to focus on one more than the others. Mm -hmm. Like, holy crap, what kind of normalizing, validating, reassuring concept is that? I get chill saying it now because like, this is the stuff that we need more of like, yeah. of course, one of my favorite phrases with clients and with people on the show is of course you would feel that way. Of course, that's yeah. what your brain is thinking of. Of course, that's what's going around. And for, I literally wrote down, it's hard to hold space for multiple children because of course it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I, like I said, I am, you know, I, I feel very strongly about being a parent to my two daughters and, and there are times when it is, it is so challenging because I am, you know, and I I say this to other moms, you know, when we talk about this, you know, if I had two living daughters here in my house, they would be pulling me in two different directions all the time. I'm sure that I have two daughters pulling me in two different directions. One is pulling me, you know, closer into reality and the present and living in the moment. And then I have this other daughter who is pulling me into this place that is so often uncomfortable and, scary and also just so incredible and beautiful in the fact that like I said before, she is just, she has shown me just how incredible and powerful love is in helping you reach the ones who aren't here. And I'm just so grateful to her for that. And, and so you know, I'm not being pulled in two different directions and like, what are we going to do today? Go to the park or, you know, stay home. It's like, we are, you know, it's, it's being pulled in two different directions of, okay, where is, where is my heart right now? And Frances is so young, you know, but we talk about Dorothy all the time. She's her sister. And I, you know, my husband and I both have pictures of her on our nightstands and we have keepsake bear that's named after her. And, you know, so she hears this name all the time and she knows, you know, she's kind of starting to get the concept of, of sister. Um, for her sister is like Anna and Elsa from Frozen. So she's a little bit like confused as to where I think, you know, like when we use that word sister, um, because Dorothy's not here, but I want her to know that I, I think what I want her to know is that I'm always going to have space for the two of them, but there are going to be times when they may be aren't occupying that same space. Like I have to go maybe to a different place in my heart, in my, you know, in my mind, mindset to parent one or the other. And so I, I think that's one of those challenges. I know that's one of those challenges of, of parenting after loss. And, and also, you know, that isn't just a challenge when you're parenting a living child. If you, all you've known is loss, if, if all of your children have died, you still find yourself torn between like we were saying before, you know, which of these losses is the most recent or the most profound or the one that's resonating the most with you at that moment. And so um, I think it's a struggle. I know it's a struggle that, that all grieving parents face. 
I know for a fact that I can be, I'm continuing to be parented by my mother who's dead. Uh, so I think I understand what you're saying, but I would love if we could get into some more detail about what it's like to parent a child who has died. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it's like any kind of parenting. It, ha- it looks different depending on your family and and what what works for you and in your lifestyle and and in even in our own household. My husband and I parent Dorothy very differently. Uh, I am I'm very I've I've decided to parent Dorothy or at the, how I've chosen to parent her at this moment in time over these last few years is by reaching out and connecting with other families through my writing. I started a blog uh, about two years ago, uh, or no, about three years ago, excuse me, started a blog about three years ago where I just started kind of putting my feelings down. It was right around the time I got pregnant with Francis and I just kind of had a lot to unload and I was just too exhausted to keep having the same conversations with people, but I wanted to talk about Dorothy and I was afraid if I didn't talk about her, then I was going to lose my opportunities. So I started putting pen to paper, you know, and writing about her and writing about where I was at. And, and I found that with writing, it was an, it allowed me to kind of connect. It allowed me to connect with other grieving parents. And it also allowed me to connect with other parents of living children, because what I was speaking about, what I was writing about was just, was about loving a child. And that is universal. I mean, we can all, whether your child's alive or, or, or dead, you, you know what that feeling is. And all parents can tap into that and connect to that. And so I found that is, you know, for me, that is how, how I parent her. Um, you know, it looks very different from my husband. He's much more, you know, he is more introverted and more private with his grief, but he does these beautiful little touches, um, these very subtle ways of parenting her that they look subtle on the outside, but they just hold such impact and, and meaning for us. You know, for example, the other night we were all lying on our bed, reading a book to our daughter and we have our little keepsake bear and he, you know, pulled Dorothy the bear in close and was like, just kind of had her in the crook of his arm. And, and it just melted me because, you know, it, it just felt so normal, you know, all four of us right there. And so he has these ways of bringing her in and creating these kind of almost snapshots of what life might be if she were here. And I, I just, I so, so appreciate him for that. And so I think, you know, we all have different ways of going about it. And again, like to try to normalize it, isn't that how all parenting is? I mean, we all parent in the ways that we know based on how we were parented or how we wish we were parented or how we see others parent. And we kind of bring that all together. And and so I find I learn so much from the community of other moms and dads who are grieving their children. I learn so much from them. I kind of get parenting tips from them about ways to connect and be closer to Dorothy. And, and, and I hope they get that from me too. And so it's, you know, we say all the time, it's, you know, a club none of us want to be in, but I know how incredibly grateful we are for each other um, because it, it's an incredible challenge and an incredible heartache to, parent a child who can't be here. And and I don't know where I would be without my ability to connect with others who know that. I think that was just a perfect response and such a neat contrast too, between how you and your husband bring Dorothy into your Mm -hmm. spaces and the permission for that to happen as it happens and not this pressure to like when people parent shame each other. (laughs) It's what I'm thinking of, like these articles yeah. of like, you're a bad parent yeah. if you meet these eight yeah. criteria or whatever. Um, it seems like even in grief, there's so much space to be different parents to your child. Well, and that's what I try to tell, you know, because I'm very, I mean, I'm very open and I'm, I've put a lot of my life and my grief out there for people. And I, I've done a lot of that because when I first was in those, you know, first weeks and months of grief, I was struggling to find someone and, 
and I eventually did find people, but I just wanted to put myself out there because I thought, okay, if one more person is out there and then maybe another person and we, they, they won't, you won't have to search so hard to find these people. But then I have moms reach out to me and say, I can't, I can't do what you do. I can't share my child's picture. I can't share my story. I can't put this out here. And I say to them, well, that's okay. You don't have to. What I'm doing is what works for my family and you are doing what works for your family. And there is no, just because you want your grief to be private and for you and you want to hold it in your own way does not mean that you are ashamed or you should be ashamed. There's no shame in grieving privately. And, and I think that can be hard for people to remember. And now that there is so much, um, open grieving online in these communities and these networks and these hashtags. And, and I just want everyone to know there's, there's no shame in, in keeping those things private. And to counter that, there is no shame in being incredibly open and sharing your child. Both, both are valid and loving ways to parent your children and both need support and acceptance. So I'm going to ask the million dollar question that people always seem to ask parents is, oh, so how many kids do you have? Yeah. <laughs> so I say two. Um, and I, we, I'm in a parenting after loss support group, parenting and pregnancy after loss support group. And we actually were just discussing this the other night. It is easier, I think, for me now to answer that question that I have a, ch- a living child because I can say two. And if I just say two, someone can assume my other child is with their father or somewhere else or with a friend, you know what I mean? Like just not there in the moment. Sure. Um, when it gets, I think it's hard. It was so much harder when I was pregnant with Francis and people asked me how many children I had because I didn't have any any in my arms, you know, I was obviously carrying a child and I had Dorothy, but I didn't have any to show pictures of, or, you know, so I struggled so much with that. And I think I also struggled so much with that because I was dealing with so much fear of Francis not surviving and, and, you know, never having a living child. Um, it, it is, I, I don't have, a patented answer for everybody for that. Like, I don't have a one answer that I give to everyone. I really am very kind of day by day. I'm very cautious about who I'm going to open up with sometimes. Um, you know, sometimes I'm just like two, I have a daughter who was stillborn and then this is my daughter, Princess. she's two. And then some days I just say two and I leave it at that and I let the awkwardness hang. And some days, you know, if someone says, you know, is this your only child and I'm exhausted and I just smile, I don't say yes. I don't say no. I just smile and kind of let them think what they need to think or want to think. And it all depends on how much of a connection I'm going to be building or I foresee myself building with that person, you know, stranger in the grocery store, I don't know. I mean, maybe they need to know my whole life story. Probably not. My whole life story, I feel like it's online at this point. So, you know, (laughs) you know, it's not that I'm afraid to share. It's just sometimes I'm, I, you know, it's that protection piece. Like how, you know, do I want to do this here? Do I want to do this right now? And, and I know so many parents struggle with that question because it feels like if you don't answer it, so incredibly honestly you are betraying the child who's not here the children who aren't here and I so I so get that and I so feel that still all the time and and I don't know if that'll ever go away but it stopped feeling like such a crushing thing and it just feels more like this little twinge now and and I also know that I'm I'm like any parent I'm doing the best I can And that's just one of those times when you just do the best you can. If it's okay with you, I would love to read a piece of your own writing back to you. Sure. Excellent. Um, This is the piece that I discovered on your Instagram page of Dear Abby, and I'm going to clip a little excerpt of it. And then I want to ask you immediately after what you felt reading this piece, like what was the thing 
that sparked this because I just had such a visual reaction to this. And I am not a bereaved mother. That's not an identity that I hold. And to just see these words on paper and to be so wide eyed about it, just so clear eyed and, and crisp and terse. I was like, man, that I, it, I, I don't even really have words for it right now. So I'm just going to read yours. Uh, it starts this way. It says, Oh, Abby, I saw your column today. The one where you gave advice to crystal in Nevada. She wrote to you asking how to cope with her aunt who had a stillbirth 20 years ago. Crystal wanted to know how to talk to this aunt who lives such a quote unquote morbid lifestyle to encourage her to move on from a quote baby that never lived. Instead of encouraging Crystal to approach her aunt with grace and compassion, you validated her misguided views about grief. You called her aunt's desire to celebrate her child's birthday sad. You assumed that her aunt had not sought any kind of counseling. Perhaps you think counseling cures a person's heartache for their child? Do you know how many families read your column today who have also experienced the loss of a child? I cannot speak for every one of them, but I know many were hurt and even angry at the way you were so quick to judge the heartbreak of a grieving mother. I know the heaviness in my own heart as I read your response. 20 years is not too long to miss your baby. And I'll stop there. It goes on, but oh my word, I, it was a beautiful middle finger and I love it. Thank you. Um, I was pissed (laughs) when I read that. Not when I, obviously not when I read my own writing. I was pissed when I read Abby's response. Um, So as so often happens in this wonderful community of of mothers and fathers that built around me, um, the pitchforks (laughs) were raised by the time I got online. Um, I had a couple messages from people um, saying, had you seen this? Had you seen this? So I checked it out. I read a response that one of my other um, friends had written and I read it for myself and I was just floored. I just felt this knot. I felt this knot in my chest, the one that I get when I'm trying to validate my experience to people who just aren't getting it. And I, and the knot was not just there for me. It was there for the mother who was newly bereaved who happened upon this article and thought, Oh my God, I've got to get over this. I just was so angry that, that, that it was just such, such terrible advice and such, it was just so wrong that somebody might read that who didn't yet have a community surrounding them, who didn't yet have support, who hadn't yet, you know, worked through, this or started this healing process or or leaned into her grief and just would read that and think, oh, I'm I need to be over this. Everybody's gonna think I'm morbid. What a sad life I'd be living. And I just it just the literally out loud as I read it is when I said, Oh Abby, I just was just <laughs> floored by her. And I think it angered me too because it, what angered me after I wrote my response were the people who commented on it or reached out to me to say, well, she's from a different time. I don't take that as an excuse. I, I don't believe that grief is that, I don't believe that grief is that different from generation to generation. I do believe the response to it is. And it was just painful for me to see a woman who is supposedly such a beacon of advice and support to be passing on these misguided and and outdated views on grief. I mean, who, who, and maybe it's because I'm so kind of immersed in this world now and, and spend so much of my time thinking and talking about it as part of my healing, but I just, the idea of a timeline being put on grief, just, it, it, made me angry. And so I wrote to Abby. I don't know that she's ever read my response, but it really wasn't necessarily for her. My response was for the person who read it and doubted their how they were feeling. I wanted to erase that doubt. I wanted them to know that is what you are feeling, the way you are missing your child, the way you are loving your child, the way you want to celebrate your child, that is valid. And that is what is real. 
I think the work that you're doing in the world is so magnificent and that's just the right spot to end uh, for the day. So I would love for you to let people know where you would like to be found, both online, offline, anywhere you exist that you'd like to be found. Yeah. So I write a blog called An Unexpected Family Outing, uh, and you can find that at uh, unexpectedfamilyouting.com. I have a Facebook page that's connected to my blog where I share my writing and the writings of other families that um, inspire me and, and share this share this life with me. I do have an Instagram. Um, you can find me at Lady Whalen. Uh, and I do, it's my personal Instagram, but I share a lot about grief there. And probably the project that I'm most excited for right now and is really motivating me. I am currently working on starting a nonprofit uh, pregnancy, infant, and child loss resource center with a fellow writer and lost mom by the name of Emily Long, who has written some fantastic books. Her books were what pulled me out of my grief kind of dark place um, and brought me into, she kind of carried me over into a place of healing. And lo and behold, she happens to live in the beautiful state of Vermont with me. So we have connected and so we're working on this project together. Uh, it's called Lumos House. The idea is it's like this lighthouse, this beacon uh, for anyone who's lost a child in our job. We see ourselves kind of as those light carriers and we're going to show you different resources and options for you to tap into your grief um, and in whatever ways work for you. I want to thank you so much for coming on, coming back today. And Grief Growers, if you want to see the post that I read from, the full post, Dear Abby, you got it wrong. Uh, it's on Rachel's Instagram on June 7th. And I'm going to be reposting this over on my Facebook page too, so you can see her original post and I'll link back to your Instagram page. Uh, Rachel, thank you so much for taking the time to come on, coming back today and sharing your story with us. This was just so insightful. Thank you so much for having me. So that's all for this episode of Coming Back. Thank you so much to Rachel Whalen, who came on Coming Back for her very first podcast interview ever. I'm so grateful we could unpack your letter to Dear Abby and so much more about being a mom to both living and dead children. Rachel came back through writing and by connecting to other parents who lost children through stillbirth and miscarriage. You can find all of Rachel's writing and some really cool shareable quote images on her website, An Unexpected Family Outing, which is listed in the show notes for this episode. And keep your eyeballs on my Facebook page where I'll be reposting her powerful letter to Dear Abby on behalf of bereaved moms. If you're looking for more grace, space, and room to breathe in the aftermath of loss, purchase a copy of my new book, Permission to Grieve, which is live now on Amazon. To keep this little grief podcast going and to receive insider bonuses like weekly grief journaling prompts, podcast swag, and live grief support with me, pledge to support the show at patreon.com slash Shelby for Cynthia. If you liked what you heard today, subscribe to Coming Back on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and tell a friend about Coming Back because you never know what someone you love is going through. Thank you to Addie Goldstein who composed our theme music. You can find me on Facebook at Shelby for Scythia Intuitive Grief Guide, Instagram at Shelby for Scythia, or simply shelbyforscythia.com. If you'd like to leave a question or comment for a future show, email me at shelby at shelbyforscythia.com. As always, my dear grief growers, it was beautiful sharing this space and time with you today. I see you. I'm proud of you and the work that you're doing in the world. And I love you. Because even through grief, we are growing.